Hello and welcome to the Fairfax Scene. I'm your host, Rachel Roth. In this edition, we are celebrating the 60th anniversary of George Mason University. Historic Fairfax City, Inc., in conjunction with the Spotlight on the Arts Festival, hosted an evening of speakers on the 1958 land transfer that brought the university here. Mason President Dr. Angel Cabrera kicked off the presentations. In 1959, the General Assembly uh, authorized to establish a branch college in Northern Virginia. The town of Fairfax, before this became city of Fairfax, um, contributed $300,000 to buy 147 acres of land and donated the site to the University of Virginia, which, as you know, was at that time the, the, the entity that, uh, that owned and controlled this university. The town of Fairfax then spent about $220,000 extra to provide utilities to the site, which makes for a total of $520,000, right? About half a million dollars. Well, you go to Google, you see how much money is that in today's dollars, and it says it's about four million bucks, four and a half million bucks. I mean, it was a, it was a good sum of money, but it's in today's dollars, I mean, that would be the equivalent of, you know, a couple of maybe you know, three nice homes. For that investment, for that investment, if you think now, imagine, fast forward just 50 years, fast forward 50 years, can we even imagine Fairfax without George Mason University? And uh, this may be a little bit of a leap of faith on my part, but I would venture to say that there hasn't been a smarter investment in the history of Fairfax than that half a million dollars to purchase that land and to make sure that the university would happen here. I mean, think about the value. Hundreds of millions of dollars, actually billions of dollars in capital that the Commonwealth of Virginia poured just around the corner. And most importantly, the incalculable human capital talent that has come to this region, that has come out of this region, and has been attracted to this region as a consequence of that investment. So the, the best places in the world to live, anywhere in the world, the best cities in the world, they're all anchored by at least one world-class university. They're drivers of economic growth. They're drivers of a vibrant cultural and uh, cultural life. Well, for half a million dollars in today's dollars, or, or for, in, for four and a half million dollars in today's dollars, um, uh, those folks, folks who were here, uh, uh, before us uh, really turned what could have been a nice but relatively sleepy town in Northern Virginia in an absolutely phenomenal place. So here's what, what happened. By the way, was, it's fascinating because in this one of these original uh, strategic plans, this is an official document. This was the official strategic plan of 1968 to 1975. These are the plans where I think many of us have been involved in elaborating these plans where you try to, to, to dream big, right? To be ambitious, to say this is what we want to do. Here was the ambition, a regional university for Northern Virginia. That was the ambition. The university arranged for the preparation of a master plan for George Mason College, which envisioned that it would be a community junior college which would accommodate one day 2,500 students. <laughs> so at the time, at the time when this investment was made, that was the big idea, that was the big dream. So what has happened since? What has happened since is that we're now 37,000 students strong. We have become the largest university in Virginia, the largest public university in Virginia. We are the fastest growing university in Virginia. Over the last decade, over the last decade, half of the entire growth in student enrollments in Virginia, half in the entire Commonwealth, has been driven by your university, half. So Virginia wants more graduates. There is a, a really a, a strategic goal for Virginia that we need to produce many more graduates. Half of the work in growing that number is being done at your university. We're not just growing in volume, we're growing in quality. The graduation rates are up. Uh, and are an extraordinary level for the, for the type of university we are. We serve an incredibly diverse student population. We are the most diverse student population 
along the East Coast, definitely by far the most diverse university in, uh, in Virginia. We educate uh, students of all colors, races, religions, countries. About a third of our students qualify for Pell Grants, which means that they have high financial need. When we're done with them, or they're done with us, or whatever, whoever is done with whom, uh, everybody's graduating at the same time. This is unheard of. I've been looking at the data again today, and it's unbelievable. Black students, Hispanic students, white students, Asian students, no matter how you cut the data, everybody's graduating at the same time. If you compare Pell Grant recipients with non-Pell Grant recipients, students that come with high financial need, non-financial need, Everybody's graduating at the same time. This just doesn't happen across American higher education. I wish one day these will stop being bragging points because everybody does the same thing. There's still, unfortunately, big bragging points for your university. So we're growing in size, we're growing in quality, we're serving an incredibly diverse student body, we're producing amazing outcomes, and on top of that, we have become now a top research university. Some fields led the way the history department, embracing, and, and always by, by choosing fields that at the time someone would have thought, these guys are crazy. You're bringing the internet to history? What are you talking about? Well, because of that, we now have this extraordinary history department. In other areas, like economics, or law, or engineering, throughout the university, we've picked areas where maybe they were out of the box and they have made us stand out. So two years ago, we received the great news, scary news, intimidating news somehow, that your university had now been reclassified as what is known in the industry as a, a, a research one, tier one, very high research university. Well, it turns out there are only 115 of those in the country. The other 114, they've been around for 100 years, and 200 years, and 300 years. And there are Ivy League schools and very well endowed private schools. And there are the flagship universities of some states, not all of them. And then there's George Mason. And right now, we are the youngest university to be considered a tier one uh, research university. Back track now to that investment of a half a million dollars of the 50s, five million of today's money. And wouldn't you agree that that was the smartest, best ROI investment that this city or this county has ever made? Well, that was a wonderful idea, and uh, thank you for having me today. So thank you very much for having me. I've been asked to talk about the creation of the city of Fairfax. And if this discussion were being held 60 years ago, I doubt very much that the atmosphere would be as genial as it is tonight. <clears throat> Many of the personalities involved were residents of the then town of Fairfax who found themselves at odds with their neighbor on opposing sides of a contentious issue. Uh, the people of Fairfax were also residents of the county. For some, this clearly caused a conflict within them as to their allegiance. Now, 60 years on, as the saying goes, time heals all wounds. Well, let's start at the beginning. Uh, the beginning, uh, of course, for us was 1799, and as a result of the sig significant population growth in the county, the, court the courthouse was no longer within the standard day's ride of horseback for most county residents. And at the suggestion of Richard Ratcliffe, a uh, county court justice, who offered the county four acres of land for one dollar, a site was selected in the center of the county at the crossroads of the Falls Church Road, and that's today's Oley Highway, Main Street, and the other crossroads was Elsie's Church Road, which we now know as Chambridge Road or Route 123. Richard Radcliffe was an entrepreneur of the first order. His motivation in granting land to the county was not entirely benevolent, as he owned several thousand acres around the new courthouse site and stood to benefit from the growth of the new courthouse community. The courthouse was completed in 1800 and Richard Radcliffe began to plan a new town around the building. On January 14, 1805, he received a charter from, for the town of Providence from the Virginia General Assembly. The town was known as Providence until 1859 when the town of Culpeper abandoned its former name, Fairfax, and assumed the name of the county. Immediately, Fairfax County named its county seat Fairfax Courthouse. 
after the Civil War in 1874 by an act of the General Assembly, the Fairfax Courthouse became incorporated as the town of Fairfax. Its boundaries were set by a subsequent act of the General Assembly on February 16, 1892. The boundaries of the town of Fairfax, just two and a half square miles then, remained fixed from 1892 to 1957. However, during that time, the town experienced significant population growth during the 1950s uh, by the post-war baby boom. From 1950 to 1960, the population grew from 1,946 uh, souls to 13,585. To accommodate this growth, most of our subdivisions, Westmore, Fairview, Green Acres, and Mosby Woods were constructed at this time. This burgeoning population also attracted business opportunities. Fairview Shopping Center, Fairfax Shopping Center, Pickett Shopping Center, and Turnpike Shopping Center were all constructed uh, at this time. Real estate assessments and city revenues soared. As a result of all, all of this, town services were either improved or expanded. Roads were constructed. Main Street was widened from two lanes to four in 1957. The old town water system, which relied on wells stationed around the, the, uh, the town, was abandoned in favor of a new modern water system and a sewage treatment plant. At this pre precise moment in time, the city was blessed with several gifted leaders, and I'm, I'm somewhat of a fatalist. I do believe in, in fate. So these individuals responded to the needs of the growing population while strategically positioning the town to take advantage of the opportunities afforded us. In Virginia, in the 1950s, counties had little authority to prevent towns and cities from annexing adjacent county land. Elsewhere in Virginia, entire counties had been annexed. Princess Anne County and Nansemond are two examples of counties that are now extinct uh, as they were annexed by, the, you know, and we know the names, the city of Virginia Beach and the, and the city of Suffolk. Nearby, the cities of Alexandria and Falls Church had previously annexed land from both Arlington County and Fairfax County, and along with the town of Fairfax, were looking to acquire more land from the county. There were several reasons for this, uh, strengthening the tax base of the town, administering services more easily and effectively, which I believe we still can do, and three, perhaps uh, to have enough of a population to at some point become a city. Well, as I mentioned, there were, there were several giants that, 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 that the city had at this time that were you know, tremendous leaders, and, and one of those personages was John Clinton Wood. John C. Wood, Jack to his friends, was elected to the town council in 1952. He was appointed mayor in 1953 to serve out the unexpired term of Robert B. Walker, who resigned on account of ill health. Jack served as the mayor of Fairfax, both town and city, until 1962. He was born in, in New York and moved to the Washington area with his parents in 1936 when he was 18 years old and entered the University of Virginia. During his first year at UVA, he learned that a hereditary ailment was robbing him of his eyesight. Called retinitis pigmentosa, it was slowly damaging the uh, blood vessels of his eyes. He was able to finish college before losing his sight nearly entirely in 1950. Jack and his wife, Louise, uh, her friends called her Dickie, were married in 1945. They raised two children, John and Ann, and John is still a, a prominent member of the community. In 1957, Mayor John Wood asked the town council to consider three things. First, keep, keeping the town at, at its present size and status. Two, becoming a city of the second class and annexing a portion of Fairfax County, or three, annex a portion of the county before becoming a city of the second class. The town hired a consulting firm, Wainwright and Ramsey, which specialized in annexation to advise the, the members of the council on this issue. Uh, the result was, uh, their analysis was uh, to recommend the town move forward with the annexation. The area under consideration would be served by the town's sewage treatment plant on Sherman Road, which we now know as Pickett Road, uh, which was then being expanded. The, the town manager, Glenn Saunders, and just a little footnote about Mr. Saunders, Mr. Saunders was then 30 years old. <clears throat> Mr. Saunders is still 
alive and with us at 91 years old, and uh, a little bit more on him later on. Anyway, Mr. De Mr. Saunders described the area to a reporter for the Evening Star as bounded by Sherman, a now Pickett Road, Blake Lane, and Germantown Road, the town's present northern boundary. So think about that. So we're a little town of Fairfax, two and a half acres, and we're, we're, we're thinking about annexing all the way over to Blake Lane. Well, that's clearly not within the current town or city boundary. So they were, they were thinking big, you know. And the annexation plan also included, and I think this was a strategic move on the part of certainly uh, John Wood, uh, the boundary uh, south to in include the land all the way south of where we are right now to Braddock Road. And, and what does that land now comprise? That is now George Mason University. The town already provided water and sewer services to a majority of the residents in the proposed annex area. Saunders, uh, Manager Saunders indicated that in addition to a 25% reduction in those services, residents in the proposed annexation area would receive free garbage collection and trash collection, street cleaning, snow removal, street lights, uh, street and traffic signs, and more police protection. And it's hard for us to remember now we're in a very urban uh, county, um, the, the entire county. But you know, when I was young, and, and certainly when some of you in the room were even younger, um, I, but I remember, I remember civilization pretty much ended at the city limits, you know, west, just west of here. Beyond that, it was cows and, and farms and not, not a whole lot more. And, in response, uh, the Fairfax County manager, Carlton Massey, acknowledged that the county, which had expanded rapidly since 1950, was experiencing difficulty in providing these basic services to its residents. Water and sewer, sewer services were then in high demand. I mean, just basic services, you know, the, the county residents were not, not receiving. Matthew further acknowledged that residents in the built-up areas surrounding the cities of Alexandria and Falls Church, as well as the towns of Fairfax and Vienna, one of the types of services provided in those localities and were willing to annex or incorporate themselves to get them. However, however, Massey believed that, quote, the situation demands that an integrated system under the county was the most effective way to, to provide these services, end quote. He understood that annexation and incorporation was the major threat to orderly planning and development of these facilities in the county. The Fairfax Town Council briefed the County Board of Supervisors in a closed session in December 1957 of their plans. In 1958, the town filed suit to annex 2,224 acres of Fairfax County into the town of Fairfax. The chairman of the County Board of Supervisors was Providence District Supervisor James Keith and a resident of the town of Fairfax. And while we do not know exactly what Mr. Keith was saying. It's, I certainly don't. There's probably two people in the room that do because his son and daughter are, are in, this, in this room. Um, and that is our president and his sister and fellow board member. I hope you're getting the sense of this, that this was like a local you know, city, county, town. You know, and it's, it's, it's important to remember, at this stage, we are all Fairfax County residents. You know, we're, we're, we're residents of the town, but we are governed by, largely by the, by the uh, County Board of Supervisors, um, of which Mr. Keith was the chairman. Uh, while we, as I said, while we don't know exactly what Mr. Keith, because um, although I did get to meet him, I did, I didn't, we didn't discuss this particular uh, topic, but he is quoted as saying that he did not strongly oppose annexation. Um, I'm sure he probably felt a little stronger about um, uh, lo uh, losing the, the town to, uh, to an uh, independent city. Anyway, the case, uh, the, city, the town filed suit, and the case was heard by a three-judge panel uh, led by Fairfax County Circuit Court Judge Paul E. Brown. And another footnote to Mr. Brown, and this is, this is where you're going to start getting the sense of the fix is kind of in on this thing. <laughs> Paul Brown grew up on Cedar Avenue in the town of Fairfax. So what do you think, what do you think uh, Judge Brown's decision was? Judge Brown uh, decided the case in favor of the town for annexation. The, ca the county appealed the annexation decision to the Virginia Supreme Court in 1959. Their discussion, in their decision, the court noted that the many residents of the annexed area, quote, favored annexation and none opposed, end quote. 
the court added that, quote, all in all, the town appears to be well organized, virile, and, progress and a progressive municipality, fully capable of meeting current and future problems successfully, and evidence does not show that the county, 400 square miles in area, will suffer irreparable damages as, as a result of the annexation, end quote. I like, the, I like the first part of that quote. All in all, the town appears to be well organized, virile, and managed effectively. I like that part. <laughs> Adding insult to injury, uh, the court awarded the town recovery of appeal damages uh, from the county. Three and a half miles of the county territory was incorporated into the town of Fairfax effective January 1st, 1960. In response to this decision, you'd think that this would be the end of it. You know, everybody goes away happy. Well, not so. In response to this decision, uh, and facing additional annexation threats and further loss of ter territory from Falls Church and Alexandria, Fairfax County seriously considered consolidating with the, city, with the town of Clifton as a city. Under Virginia law, such a move would have vacated the charter of the town of Fairfax as well as those of Herndon and Vienna. Suddenly, the issue became one of survival for the town of Fairfax. Under Virginia law, the only way for this to happen was for the town to become um, consolidated with the county, which was actually discussed and rejected by the, uh, the town council, Fairfax Town Council, or to become a city of, of either the first or second uh, order. Jack Wood's argument became one of preserving the community of the town of Fairfax as, as an entity and protecting the considerable recent investments the town had made in infrastructure, uh, a new water plant, a new sewer, sewer plant, park plant, et cetera. The town council argued that the town's assets would be spread throughout the new city of Fairfax County, which was one of the names that was suggested for the new large locality, instead of benefiting only the Senate, citizens of the town. At this time, there were persuasive arguments in, that indeed had merit. On April 21st, 1961, Mayor Wood stated to the Evening Star, we do not intend to be wiped out or have our political integrity erased by somebody else, end quote. Now, do you want to tangle with a guy like that? I don't think so. <laughs> On May 1st, 1961, the town quietly filed a petition at the courthouse to become a city. The, the county political leadership did not discover this filing until six days later on May 10th. Uh, when Robert Fitzgerald, who was the Commonwealth's attorney, found out about this, he went directly to the clerk's office, uh, and the clerk was uh, the, the repository of the filing and all the court, court filings and still is. And the clerk at the time was, was a man by the name of Thomas P. Chapman, Jr. Thomas P. Chapman, Sr. was the mayor of the town of Fairfax in 1936. And Thomas P. Chapman, Jr. lived on the corner of Chambers Road and Center Street, and his house still stands in the town and now city of Fairfax. So what do you think Thomas Chapman's allegiance uh, lay? And when asked by Robert Fitzgerald, why didn't you, why didn't you notify us of, of the filing? He said, no one asked me. <laughs> on May 10th, Judge Brown signed an order authorizing the county to hold a referendum on becoming a city on July, July 11th, the date of the Democratic primary. Also on May 10th, Judge Brown approved the, town, moved, approved the town moving forward in its request to become a city by appointing six enumerators to count the number of residents in each of the six precincts of the town in order to verify the town's population. This procedure was required by state statute. The town residents wasted no time in counting their population, which was certified at over 13,000, far more than enough to qualify for a city of the second class, which was actually 5,000. This second class is a legal uh, classification, not a cultural uh, or commentary on you know, our, our, our fine city. First class cities are completely autonomous from the county. Second class cities enjoy virtual autonomy. In both first and second class cities, residents pay local taxes only to the city and not to the county. A town, on the other hand, has only a small degree of independence and may impose taxes for the extra services it provides, but the county also imposes taxes on town residents. On June 21st, 1961, the town council, with Ed Pritchard abstaining, and we'll talk about that in a moment, directed the town attorney to submit a final petition to, to the same Judge Brown. The county board of supervisors had already announced its intention to pursue city status 
and Judge Brown authorized the county, the county and Clifton to proceed with a co consolidation referendum. So this was now a race against time. With less requirements for the city, and because the city was more nimble in its submissions to the court, and clearly had friends within the clerk's office, uh, Judge Brown approved the town's petition and ordered it to become a city on June 30th, 1961. On July 5th, the day after Independence Day, perhaps an appropriate metaphor, the city and new town council held, it, held its first organized organizational meeting. This new city council took several bold actions. Voting precincts were established. Three people were appointed to a school board. A new contract was awarded to uh, City Hall, which now stands in, in where my office is. In August, a meeting was held and the council uh, approved a list of city services best provided uh, by the county. And this is where Ed Pritchard's you know, sway starts to come in. Schools, health departments, social services, courts, and sheriffs, because as soon as they became a city, all county services were, were in, in fact, you know, ceased, technically ceased. At this time, the, the fledgling city had seven employees. I think we're well over 300, maybe even approaching 400 now. Um, outside of police and fire and public works. Um, they provided administrative services for nearly 14,000 new, new city residents. Um, beaten to the punch by the town, the city of Fairfax, by the city of Fairfax, now city of Fairfax, Fairfax County sought, continue, uh, con continued to seek ways to explore the loss of territory by annexation. In 1960, the General Assembly had authorized a new urban county executive form of government. Among the provisions of this form of government are no new towns or cities to be incorporated within the boundaries of such counties. By referendum of voters, uh, the Fairfax, Fairfax County residents adopted this form of government in November 1960. In addition, since at least 1987, the General Assembly has imposed a statutory ban on city-initiated annexations uh, grants of charters uh, for new independent cities and grants of charter uh, grants for county immunity. And what that means is, is we cannot, uh, as a, even as a city, and because we're part within the boundaries of an urban county, we cannot annex any land uh, from, from Fairfax County. It's only by mutual agreement. Um, as if this story were not odd enough, uh, an additional footnote occurred uh, five years after the city uh, gained its independence. And, and autonomy. Um, the seat of uh, Fairfax Com County government in November 1966 was technically within the city of Fairfax. Our, our friend Paul Brown, with a stroke of his print, pen, moved the 25, now 45 acres uh, Fairfax County courthouse and jail complex back into the county. And that's why we have an island of Fairfax County within the borders of our, our city. Um, some closing observations to this story. Um, Jack Wood led this community in the effort to gain city status. He moved, uh, and through, through largely or through his efforts, he moved, uh, he had George Mason College of the University of Virginia move to what is now the border of uh, the city of Fairfax. He was ultimately to serve on George, Mason, uh, George Mason's board um, uh, as governing body, the Board of Visitors, as his rector. Ed Pritchard, had another approach during this time. Ed, Ed was also a non-native of Virginia. He was a native of Montana. Um, uh, he was appointed to the town council in 1953 to fill out the unexpired term of, guess who? Jack Wood, who was appointed mayor. Ed served, had, had previously served as chairman of the first zoning uh, commission in the town. He was an attorney and he was also an architect of the town's first zoning ordinance, and he was a, an extraordinary attorney. During World War II, Ed served in the Office of, of Strategic Services, or the OSS, a precursor to the Central Intelligence Agency. While stationed in Cairo, Ed met Nancy Pritchard, also an employee of the OSS. They were married in 1945. They have three children, Nancy, Tom, and uh, Robert. Ed Pritchard favored expansion of the town of Fairfax by annexation, but was a reluctant supporter of the petition to become a city. He was later to play the role of peacemaker and an alternative voice for engagement and reconciliation with the county. 
with the new city of Fairfax and the political support that helped John Wood achieve separate city status, status began to shift. The citizens only wanted to go so far. As the city moved to develop its charter in late 1961 and early 1962, John Wood continued to advocate for the city to be separate. He wanted us to be you know, completely independent of the county, you know, our own sheriff, our own clerk, our own school system, you know, the, whole, the whole thing. By 1962, Ed's, Ed Pritchard's more moderate position gained support, and he actually defeated John Wood and became mayor of the city of Fairfax. Ed Pritchard said at the time, quote, this is about a different approach. Jack Wood and I live in the same city. This is not personal at all, and I hope he sees it that way, end quote. And doesn't that, for those who knew him, doesn't that not sound like Ed Pritchard? As mayor, unlike Jack Wood, who favored complete separation with the county, Ed understood that the economies of scale favored cooperation with Fairfax County. With dogged determination, he led the effort to restore harmonious relations with, with the county and had a major hand in a compact with the county under which the county retains uh, office and court space within the city and, op and operated our school system. And that compact still exists to this day. Ed also provided strong support for George Mason University and helped the college grow from a full uh, into a full-fledged state university, from George Mason College to George Mason University. And he too, you know, served, and I think there might have been a little bit of rivalry between he and John Wood, although he probably wouldn't admit it, because he too served as rector of George Mason University. So what's the moral of the story? The moral of the story is there's a lesson that can be learned in that differences of opinion and that those and, and are okay. And those differences make can can make a place that's distinctive where local histories and quirks can be celebrated by everyone. And that's what we enjoy here today. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining me on this quick trip through history. Today, George Mason University is a nationally significant institution with an enrollment of about 37,000 on five campuses in Northern Virginia and Korea. The 567-acre Fairfax campus looks like a small but busy city during the school week. But like many truly great institutions, it had a very humble beginning. The story behind George Mason University's coming to Fairfax is a unique one, with plot twists and turns, heroes and anti-heroes, winners and losers. But mostly it's a story of passionate individuals from Northern Virginia who would not give up on having public higher education available locally for their children. For those of you who might not know, this is Senator Harry Flood Byrd Sr. He was the architect of a long-running era of democratic domination of Virginia politics running from 1925 to 1965. During the first half of the 20th century, the expansion of higher ed opportunities in the Commonwealth was not much of a priority uh, for the Byrd organization. You see, democratic governors and legislators in Virginia tended to be fiscally conservative and did not like to spend during that period. Uh, this type of policy has been called cash and carry politics. Uh, government spending was just limited to immediate needs. Uh, state colleges and universities were kind of expensive and thought of as luxury items. After World War II, this began to change. GI Bill adopted in 1944 caused a large number of veterans to consider a college education after the war. Large universities in Virginia uh, UVA, William and Mary, and Virginia Polytechnic Institute, otherwise known as Virginia Tech, uh, began outreach in the form of extension centers and branches. Uh, UVA would have Mary Washington, Clinch Valley College, and George Mason College. William and Mary would have Richmond Professional Institute, Richard Bland College, and its Norfolk branch, which later became ODU. Uh, VPI had acquired Radford State Teachers College in 1943 and had several extension centers in Norfolk and Richmond. So a sort of competition uh, begins between them and all three begin looking for a place in Northern Virginia to put an affiliated institution. Uh, Northern Virginia was sort of the last frontier. It was unlike the rest of the com Commonwealth in that 
there were a large number of higher educated families who were neither born nor educated in Virginia. Uh, they migrated here beginning in the 1930s to work in federal government jobs or in the military. Uh, many of these transplants in Alexandria, Arlington, and Falls Church tended to have more liberal values, while the rest of Virginia was mainly conservative. So, in 1949, the University of Virginia President Colgate Whitehead Darden Jr., a former Democratic governor of Virginia from 1942 to 1946, and by default, a former member of the Bird Machine, begins to investigate the idea of a branch of the University of Virginia in Northern Virginia. And unlike most politicians from the southern and western parts of the Commonwealth, Dar Darden is sympathetic towards Northern Virginia because he has friends here. One such friend is Arlington lawyer and University of Virginia alumnus C. Harrison Mann, Jr. Uh, Darden contacts Mann by phone to ask him to organize local citizens to help the university make inroads into Northern Virginia. This is important as Darden did not want for the state legislature to see the idea as an attempt at a power grab. This needed to look like it was the local citizen's idea. According to Mann, the call went something like this. Darden phones him up and says, Hank, the people of Northern Virginia need higher education and they don't know it yet. <laughs> However, many Northern Virginians did know it. Uh, they had already either sent or anticipated sending their children downstate or across the Potomac River for college. Uh, Mann relays the substance of this phone call to some of his acquaintances in Arlington County, and these individuals jump into this initiative with both feet. President Darden and C. Harrison Mann set up a group of about 10 people to establish an extension center in Arlington at Washington Lee High School over on Quincy Street. Uh, Darden asked University of Virginia English professor by the name of John Norville Gibson Finley to head up the center. Northern Virginia University Center is an extension center and not a traditional college. Uh, classes are geared more toward certifications and are adult ed type courses for the most part. Uh, it opens in 1950 and is a smashing success. As a matter of fact, it's still in operation today at Falls Church. The success of the center inspires its creators to dream bigger, more specifically, a traditional college for their children to attend. Now here's a photo of Director Finley and an assistant setting up chairs for an evening class at the Northern Virginia University Center. In 1954, three important things happen. First, UVA selects a group of Northern Virginia citizens to advise the Extension Center and plan for a possible branch college of the University of Virginia. It's called, of all things, the Advisory Committee. It consists of representatives from the governments of Alexandria, Arlington, Falls Church, and Fairfax County. Fairfax County is represented by an H.B. Bloomer Jr., Mr. and Mrs. R.A. Osborne, and School Board Chairman Richard E. Shands. Next, C. Harrison Mann is elected to the House of Delegates, uh, where he'll spend the next 16 years. And the forces for a college in Northern Virginia now have one of their own in the legislature. But the Virginia General Assembly passes a law that requires all new branch colleges to obtain its approval. Uh, it seems as if they wanted to slow down the proliferation of new colleges especially in light of the upcoming Brown versus Board of Education ruling in May of that year. While it would take two more years until there was an official legislative approval for the new college, local landowners and their attorneys uh, begin to find out that there may be a new college built in, in the Northern Virginia area sometime soon. One of these attorneys is John C. Jack Wood, mayor of the town of Fairfax. Though legally blind from a disease that attacked his sight as a college student, Wood is well connected, he exudes a can-do attitude, and becomes a fixture in Fairfax politics and business matters. In 1955, Delegate Mann and others in the General Assembly commissioned a study on the need for expanded higher ed opportunities in Virginia. It's called The Crisis in Higher Education in Virginia and a Solution. 
In February of 1956, the bulk of the General Assembly is moved by this report. Both houses approve a resolution to create a branch college in, in, uh, of the University of Virginia in Northern Virginia, and we're on our way. The advisory committee begins working closely with the Board of Visitors at the University of Virginia to select attractive land. The rule in Virginia is if you supply the land, the state will supply the money for the buildings if they're approved. So Mayor Jack Wood represented Edwin Carr and James McElwain, who together owned a desirable parcel of land called Ravensworth Farm at the junction of Braddock Road and the proposed Capitol Beltway. On May 16, 1956, Wood and his clients offered the property for sale to the university. By 1957, there are two clear finalists for the uh, land to build the college on. There's attractive land on Route 606, just outside of Herndon, owned by the A. Smith Bowman Distillery, where Virginia Gentleman Bourbon is made. And there's the aforementioned Ravensworth Tract. There seems to be a difference of opinion between the advisory committee and the Board of Visitors about which tract of land to choose. Uh, the advisory committee is in favor of, of Ravensworth, mostly because of its location. It's within easy reach of the potential students of, for the university, or for the college, rather. Um, Ravensworth also has historical significance. The farm belonged to the Fitzhugh family, which had ties to the Custis and Lee families. And as a matter of fact, uh, Robert E. Lee and his bride Anna honeymooned at Ravensworth. Uh, the owners offer 50 free acres with the option to buy additional land at about $2,600 per acre. On the other hand, the Board of Visitors in Charlottesville is in favor of the land at Herndon, and it's mostly because of its price, free. Um, <laughs> the Bowman family is offering 250 acres with the option to buy more acreage later. But the location is unacceptable to the advisory committee because it's just too far away uh, from Falls Church, Arlington, Alexandria, which is kind of the feeder towns for the school. So a very ugly and public debate occurs between both parties, and 1957 closes without a decision. Meanwhile, the Branch College was supposed to open in 1957. So in order to open the branch, the university needed a temporary building. Jack Wood who is knowledgeable about the project, checks into the old Bailey's Elementary School at the corner of Route 7 and Columbia Pike in Bailey's Crossroads. He knew it had been vacant since 1954, as he is also the counsel for the Fairfax County Public Schools. <laughs> he works out a deal for the university to lease Bailey's for about $600 per year. The new branch at Bailey's Crossroads begins operation on September 23, 1957, and it goes by the name University College of the University of Virginia. It would be renamed George Mason College in 1960. So the sign here, and I don't know if you can see it close enough, but you can see George Mason College is on another piece of plywood nailed on top of the sign when they changed the sign. So this picture is post-1960. Uh, the registration was a little bit lower than expected, only 17, but President Darden tells his director, John Norville Gibson Finley, to proceed. Uh, enrollment increases, and by 1963-64, the final year at Bailey's, there are about 230 students. The former Bailey's Elementary was built in 1922, had eight rooms, leaky plumbing, and had been characterized as hot in the summer and cold in the winter by those who had attended it. The former tenant, Bailey's Elementary School, left when the new Bailey's was built about a mile to the northwest near Lake Barcroft in 1954. So if you recall, we left off the site location debate of 1957. As Board of Visitors, uh, the Board of Visitors tells President Darden that the Northern Virginians won't accept the Herndon site and the Board of Visitors is not about to back down. They're not in love with Ravensworth for a number of reasons, one of them being that the land is not as free as the land out in Herndon. So Darden must be feeling the pressure to get this thing moving again. And on January 13th, he writes a letter to Delegate Mann saying, if we can't get this thing moving, 
maybe we just forget the project altogether. So, again, in steps Mayor John C. Wood. He must have known, he must have heard about the letter from President Darden. Wood obviously knows that things are going badly for the site selection. He is, after all, the lawyer for the principals in the Ravensworth group. So Wood calls a rare emergency Sunday meeting of the Fairfax Town Council in this very room uh, the weekend after Finley receives the letter. He suggests to the council that the town of Fairfax find attractive land and enter the competition itself. The council votes unanimously to purchase a piece of land and offer it to UVA for free. And Wood has just the parcel in mind. The Far Tract. Far Tract is a 146 acre parcel located just south of the town of Fairfax, just beyond the southern terminus of Mechanic Street, which is now known as University Drive, and along Payne Street, which is now known as Ox Road or Virginia 123. The land was owned by Wilson N. N. Farr, a retired attorney for the Commonwealth of Virginia, and his daughter-in-law, Viola Orr, and had been in the Farr family since the 18th century. Two days after the council meeting, Wood has secured an initial option on the Farr tract and informs Delegate Mann of the move. Mann then tells the advisory committee, by June 1958, the town of Fairfax has begun purchase of the land from Far and Orr for about $300,000. On June 17th, Mayor Wood writes Governor J. Lindsay Allman Jr. alerting him to the availability of the property. One week later, Wood makes an official offer of the property to the University of Virginia in a letter to President Darden. Darden forwards the letter to the University of Virginia Board for consideration. So while the board probably discussed this all summer, uh, it did not officially meet until December 13th of 1958. So it was sort of a long wait for Fairfax until that final decision. At the December 13th meeting, the board voted to accept the offer. The land was deeded to the university in February of 1959. For this, the town of Fairfax received $10, the cost of registering the deed in the deed book. It would take five years from the deeding of the property to the construction of the first four buildings. On May 8th, 18, uh, 1962, the university had this sign installed at the corner of 123 and the dirt road that would later become University Drive. Pictured here are members of the town council, Mayor Wood and the director of George Mason College. Representatives from Fairfax City, the university, and the General Assembly and the Advisory Committee broke ground on August 1st, 1963. Uh, here we have from left to right, Mayor Wood, Clarence Steele of Arlington, uh, State Senator Charles Fenwick with the shovel, Director Finley and uh, Delegate Mann on the far right. On May 5th, 1964, Wood introduced the Director of George Mason College, Dr. Robert Reed, to city residents here in this room. Uh, the city was so proud of its new college that it gave several tours of its residence long before it was finished. So the campus is completed on or about August 23rd, 1964. All the equipment and furniture is moved over from Bailey's Crossroads in two or three moving vans. First phase of George Mason College, uh, buildings and parking occupies about 12 acres. Uh, there are four buildings named North, South, East, and West. The fall semester begins on September 14, 1964, with 356 freshmen and sophomores. So John Wood continued to be involved with the college and later the university until he died in 1994. As chairman of George Mason College's advisory committee, he was president, present at the moment George Mason became independent in April of 1972 and he became rector of the Board of Visitors of the newly created George Mason University a month later. For many years, Mayor Wood was a fixture at George Mason University commencements. So today, the work that's done at George Mason University impacts the nation and the world, but we certainly haven't forgotten the bond between our institution and Northern Virginia, particularly Fairfax County and city. We hope that we can continue to enrich our home here as much as it has enriched us.
We hope you've enjoyed this edition of the Fairfax Scene. If you'd like to learn more about Historic Fairfax City, Inc., visit their website at historicfairfax.org. And for more information on George Mason University, visit gmu.edu. For the Fairfax Scene, I'm Rachel Roth, and we'll see you next time.